Let's uh, look at Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 4. Jeremiah 17 and verse number 4. Which reads, And thou even thyself shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. The title for the sermon this afternoon is Burn Forever. Burn Forever. So we see that God, you know, is able to cause a fire to burn and it will never be quenched. And of course, when we think about this, what do we think about? We think about hell, don't we? We think about the, or ultimately the lake of fire and that fire will never be quenched. It's going to, going to burn for all eternity. And so we start to see the doctrine of hell being taught through this chapter. So we start there in verse number one, Jeremiah 17, verse one. It says, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. So think about this, you know, these words, pen of iron, and with the point of a diamond. You know, diamonds are a, a very, very hard rock, very hard substance. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. So what God is saying here, of course, that, you know, the, the sins that Judah has done, even though he has promised through Jeremiah that, you know, to turn back to God, and if they were to turn back, he would forgive them. If they were to turn back, they would not face the judgment of God. But Judah had gone to a point, and God knowing that they had gone to a point where they're not going to have forgiveness. That God's judgment is going to fall at its fullest. And so the idea there of the sins being written in a pen of iron or with the point of a diamond is that their sins will not be forgotten by God. He's not going to forgive them, right? They're going to continue down their downward spiral. They're going to continue worshiping the false gods. They're going to continue blaspheming God and His commandments. And so what God is saying here is your judgment is guaranteed. You are going to face the brunt of my judgment. Of course, uh, that resulting in the Babylonian captivity to come. Look at verse number 2. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills and so what god is saying is these sins that will not be forgotten or forgiven are, are they're generational sins you know their fathers have done it their fathers fathers have done it you know even the children remember all this false worship that's that's uh you know been happening on the land this isn't some recent thing you know god has given them multiple generations to get right with god and and so judgment's going to fall verse number three oh my mountain in the field i will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil okay so this was uh god's mountain this was god's heritage and god says look i'm just going to give this over to the spoil i'm going to give it all over to the babylonians when they come it says and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders and thou even thyself shall discontinue from thine heritage that i gave thee okay oh the land belongs to the jews not if they're against God, okay? Not if they're anti-God, not if they hate Jesus Christ, not if they worship a false religion. God says, look, I'm going to remove that heritage from you, right? That I gave you. I'm going to discontinue the heritage. And so, you know, we have a people in Israel today and we have many Christians that say, well, that's the Jews' land. God gave them the, Jew, gave them the land. You know, not according to the Bible. You know, if they do not love God, they're not worshiping God, they don't have the Father because they don't have the Son, that is not their land, okay? And it's just political forces, you know, trying to cause them to have that land. And I know why. We know the Antichrist is going to come. And the Antichrist who just mimics Christ, he needs his own Israel. He needs his own people. He needs his own nation because he's trying to imitate what Christ does. But moving on from there, it says, And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. So we know the enemies that they're going to serve are the Babylonians. But notice what God says in the next phrase. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger which shall burn forever. Okay? So we know this isn't just about the captivity. Okay? And, and yeah, you know, when the Babylonians came, they did burn down the temple. They did burn down Jerusalem. Hey, but that, that burning eventually stopped. Okay? It's not like that fire continued to this day. Okay? No, God says they've kindled a fire. He's so angry at them. He's so full of anger, so full of wrath. It's kindled a fire that will burn forever. And we know the only fire that burns forever, of course, is hellfire. Okay? And you know, as we've been looking at this uh, uh, you know, through the story of Jeremiah, even though they are the people of God, even though this is supposed to be God's nation, many of them are unsaved. 
In fact, this nation is basically a reprobate nation. We've seen that before, right? It's a reprobate nation. It, there's definitely reprobate people. There are unsaved people. And God is saying, look, the, the, yes, Babylon is going to come to destroy you, but my final judgment on you will be the, the eternal fires, the fires that cannot be quenched. It will burn forever. And of course, this is hell. Okay? So their ultimate judgment will be in hell. And brethren, we need to understand the doctrine of hell very well. Okay? Because truly, you know, for most people, you know, when, in order for them to be saved and, and to desire you know, salvation, it's the fear of hell. It's the fear of facing God's judgment. Okay? Where, where people say, you know what, if I could choose between heaven or hell, of course, if they're speaking honestly, they prefer heaven. They don't want to burn forever. I mean, I'm sure we've all suffered burns to some extent. You don't want to suffer that pain for all eternity in, in God's anger. But I, I do want you to notice that in verse number four, you know, some people teach that, you know, hell is a separation from God, right? They, so many churches teach this, I don't understand. It's like God set a fire somewhere in the distance and he has nothing to do with that fire now. No, look, the fire, for you have kindled a fire in mine anger. You know, what burns hell, it's the anger of God. It's the wrath of God. God is there. God is lighting up hell. Okay, all that fire that burns, it's from God. Okay, this isn't some separation from God, as we'll soon see. No, you're very, you're, you're very much in the presence of God when you're burning in hellfire. Okay, I mean, that's the scariest thing of all. You know, if God were to walk away, if God were to have nothing to do with hell, yeah, those fires will burn out. Okay, but it's God's anger that keeps those fires burning. Can you keep your finger there? And let's go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Now the prophet Isaiah also preached against the southern kingdom of Judah like uh, Jeremiah did, but Isaiah was earlier than Jeremiah. Okay? He, he was an earlier prophet than Jeremiah. I'm not sure if they really crossed paths all that much, possibly, you know, as Isaiah was older. But Isaiah also teaches something quite similar here. If you go to Isaiah 66 and verse number 22. Isaiah 66 and verse number 22. We need to think about hell. You know, it's not a pleasant thought. But, you know, it, it, it ought to drive us when we know that souls are going to burn for all eternity. But shouldn't that drive us to go, you know what? I don't want people to suffer that fate. I want to go there and give them the gospel. I want to give them the good news so they don't have to burn forever. And in Isaiah 66, verse 22, it reads, For as the new heavens and the new earth, so we know that one day, you know, we read about this in Revelation, God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Right? You say, well, maybe there's no more hell. Well, let's keep going. Which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed upon me, against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So look, even when God creates the new heavens and the new earth, even in the state of eternity with God forever, guess what's still on fire? Hell. Okay? And those that have transgressed against God, now we've all transgressed against God, haven't we? We've all sinned against God. Okay? But guess what? By receiving Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Okay? And forgotten. Okay? And Christ paid for it all. Okay? It was punished in the body of Jesus Christ. But then there are those that have not received salvation. They still stand before God as transgressors of God. And their fate will be in this fire. All right? uh, what did it say there? Uh, Neither shall their fire be quenched. The fire will burn for all eternity. And so, look, some, somehow, and, you know, don't, don't tell me to give you every single detail here, but somehow in eternity, new heavens and new earth, you know, we're going to be able to see from a distance, you know, those fires that burn and see that, you know, uh, you know just a remembrance of God's judgment, God's anger, the rejection of His Son, the rejection of the gospel, the rejection of salvation, and those fires will burn forever. And, you know, just the thought about it today, especially thinking about loved ones, people that we know, that are going to end up in that place, maybe even loved ones that are in that place right now that have passed away. You know, it's sad, isn't it? It's sad to think about those things. It's, a, it's almost like a burden upon us knowing that that's where they are. But don't forget, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth, we're going to be in a new resurrected body at that point in time. 
You know, we're, we're going to understand fully and appreciate fully the judgment of God. And even though we see these, these souls and these bodies burning for all eternity, we're just going to go, well, we just know this is righteous, God. This is the right thing that took place. This is your rightful judgment that took place. Amen. And so it's probably not going to, it's obviously not going to have that impact, you know, because we, we, you know, we, we, we have our weak flesh. We have our weak flesh. You know, we don't understand God completely. We understand God as far as what he explains to us in the Bible. But sometimes even that goes over our head a little bit, right? But we're going to be in a, in a place where we're going to fully understand. We're going to be able to see God face to face. We're going to be able to stand before the glory of God. We're going to be in our new bodies. And we're going to have a better understanding of the judgment of God and his righteousness. But the point I want to drive there, brethren, is it burns forever. Okay? There's no stopping the fires of hell. Now, if you can please turn to Revelation chapter 20, because there are those uh, that teach um, that, you know, what, when you're thrown into hell, you, you're not suffer, you, you no longer suffer. You get thrown in there, you're, you get destroyed, you're annihilated, annihilated you, don't, you don't exist anymore, as it were. Uh, the JWs teach this. Uh, does anyone know? Uh, no, no, anyone else? Uh, no, else that teach these things? Seventh day Adventists. Seventh day Adventists, believe in annihilation. Christadelphians. Yeah, uh, so it, it's, it's a strange thing. You know why they think that? Because they don't know the God of the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> they don't. They, they've just been taught God is love, right? And that's what people say. People say to you at the door. You know, how can God, be, how, how can God cause people to, to go to hell? Isn't God love? Isn't God all loving? Yeah, but He's also a very angry God. You know, you've got to pick up your Bible and read it and know the true God of the Bible, right? When you know the true God, you understand hell. You understand heaven, it, makes, it all makes sense, okay? The fact that he sacrificed his son for us, free gift, free way to heaven, and people still reject him. But Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. So this is a great passage to show those that, you know, don't believe you're going to suffer in hell for all eternity. No, verse number 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever the title for the sermon this afternoon was burn forever you know what's going to happen they're going to burn forever look you know this takes place a thousand years you know the beast and the false prophet that were thrown there a thousand years ago they're still there okay they've been burning day and night forever and ever okay for a thousand years so far and what else does it say they're tormented day and night forever and ever okay they're tormented in the flames do you remember when uh you jesus christ gave the story of the rich man that went to hell you know he said in luke 16 23 and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and see if abraham afar off and lazarus in his bosom and he cried and said father abraham have mercy on me and send lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Hey, that's a guy in hell, okay? He's, he still has consciousness. He knows he's in, he's in flames. Not, you know, he's thirsty. He needs a drop of water. But not just that, he's been tormented in the flames of hell, okay? That's a man who literally just opens his eyes. He's in hell. He's in torments. I need water. That's what, he's th that's what he wants. That's, that's second number one in hell, okay? Now, these guys are, are there for a thousand years and beyond, day and night, forever and ever. You know, this God, this part of God doesn't get preached much. <laughs> but we need to, this is the truth of the Bible, okay? This is why salvation is so important. This is why we need to make sure that our children are saved, okay? Don't just assume they're saved because they come to church. Don't just assume they're saved because they know a little bit about the Bible, Okay? Make sure that your children have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I've seen too many kids go to church and then end up hating God. You know, becoming children of the devil. You know, their parents never made sure that they understood the gospel. They just thought if we just live a Christian life, we go to church, it's all good. The Sunday school teachers are going to teach them. They're going to get saved. Maybe they're already saved. They know God. No. They need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to understand what Christ has done for them. I don't want to see my kids in hell. You know, I'd rather see, and I, and I don't even want to see this. I don't even want to see one of my kids destroy their lives. You know, uh, become a drunkard. You know, become a drug addict. You know, just be a low life bum that does nothing with his life and, and, and dies early in life. But I'd rather that, and he goes to heaven. 
than, than have a successful, productive life with all the money, all the, all, you know, everything he needs in life, and then he dies and goes to hell. I'd rather my kid just be a bum, drunkard, selfish, fornicator, you know, just living for himself, but, you know, he was saved. <laughs> I'd much rather that because for all eternity, I know that I'll be able to be with my children in heaven, okay? And not having to think about the fact that they're going to be in hellfire, you know, being tormented in the flame day and night. You're in Revelation, aren't you? Can you please go to Revelation 14? Turn to Revelation 14, verse 10. Revelation 14, verse 10. And, and, you know, if you find it hard to understand this doctrine of hell, what I want you to realize is that it was never intended for man. God did not create hell for man. You know, God was not like, I'm going to make hell because I just want to see men suffer and burn. No, you know, in Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus Christ says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's why hell was created. It wasn't for the devil and his angels to rule in hell, like the cartoons depict. No, you know, God created hell that the devil and his angels, the fallen angels, would burn there for all eternity. It was never intended for man. Okay, but of course the devil comes in, you know, brings temptations, you know, steals away the gospel, puts his false prophets in, and makes it impossible, or not impossible, but makes it very difficult for many to come to the true knowledge of, of salvation. And so, you know, it, it wasn't God's purpose. He did not want man to suffer in hellfire. That was never the plan. It was for the devil and his angels. Where did I get you to turn? Revelation 14, verse 10. Revelation 14, verse 10. As I told you, you know, hell is not separation from God. It says here, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone away from God away from the separated from god for all eternity no okay fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb who's the lamb jesus christ who's in hell burning those souls who's in hell tormenting those people day and night forever and ever it's jesus okay it's the wrath it's the anger of god that lights up hell Okay, so there's no separation. You will never be separated from God. You'll always be in the presence of God. Always. After, after your, your body dies, your soul is going to be in the presence of God. I just want to make sure it's in the presence in heaven. <laughs> in, 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 in perfect righteousness, in the glory of God, not facing the anger of God. You know, not, not dealing with God's wrath and facing His presence there. I'm sure those in hell want nothing more than for God to leave. So the fires stop burning. Okay? But no, they're very much in the presence of God. Can you please turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I just don't understand why so many preachers preach that hell is a separation from God. It's not in the Bible. Say, so why did so many people say it? Because pastors, they go to Bible college and they just learn how to be parrots. They get taught something, hell is the separation of God. You know, oh, yeah, hell is the separation of God, hell is the separation of God. Pastor, have you got a Bible verse for that? Of course it's the separation of God. Come and, no, God is right there. If you just, if you stop telling us that it's a separation from God, and you tell us that it's God lighting the fires of hell, maybe we'll finally have a proper fear of God. And we tremble when you think about God's anger. Okay, so it's so important that we understand God's wrath. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9. It says, who shall be punished, speaking about unbelievers here, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So listen, how are they going to be punished? The punishment is coming from the presence of the Lord. We already saw in Revelation that Jesus Christ, the presence of the Lamb, they're, they're in there, in the, they're, in, they're in the presence of the Lamb right there. So the fires are coming from. That's what, this, that's what destroys them. It's the presence of the Lamb and from the glory of His power. 
Man, as, as a believer, I want nothing more than to see God's glory. I want to see God's power at its fullest. But not if you're unsaved. It's going to wipe you out. Okay? And, and I, I use that term loosely. Because we know they're going to be tormented forever and ever. And the fire is never going to be quenched. They're not, they can't face the power and the glory of God in the same capacity that we can. We're going to, face, we're going to have a resurrection, perfect bodies, where we can face God's glory and power. And it's, and it's going to be wonderful. These guys are going to be resurrected in bodies of damnation, okay, just to be destroyed. And the same power and glory that we rejoice in is going to be dis- burning them for all eternity. Okay? It's coming from the power of God. Can you please turn to one more passage? Isaiah chapter 5, please. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 13. One of the sad realities of the Bible is that God has to continually increase the capacity of hell. Did you know that? Hell right now is limited in how much you can take in. And because so many in the millions are going to hell every day, God has to increase, you know, has to enlarge hell. And we see that there in Isaiah 5 verse 13, Isaiah chapter 5 verse number 13, which says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity. Now remember, Isaiah is preaching the southern kingdom. He's preaching to the same people that Jeremiah is preaching to, right? Isaiah is prophesying earlier than Jeremiah that the people are going into the Babylonian captivity. Look at this. Because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst, therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. So listen, the southern kingdom had become so wicked, right? And and God's going to judge them. God says, look, I need to enlarge hell. It needs to be made bigger to accommodate for all of you people that are going there. He's preaching again to the southern kingdom. And again, what did God say in Jeremiah? For you have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. You know, God's just having to open that space up, you know, without measure. I mean, you know, people are going to hell brethren in the millions in the millions every single day you know so this is a this is a serious doctrine you know and as 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 uh, uncomfortable as as it is we need to know it we need to understand it okay and if if this information causes someone to have some fear and leads them to salvation praise god okay praise god we need to hear preaching about hell back to jeremiah 17 and verse number five jeremiah 17 verse number five Jeremiah 17, 5 reads, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. And so the Lord is warning, you know, man not to trust in man. Okay? And so I assume there are people on the land that are hearing the preaching of Jeremiah, hearing that the Lord's going to judge us if we don't fix ourselves up, but they're trusting in other men who are saying, no, it's all going to be good. You know, God's not angry at us. You know, it's all going to be fine here. And so they're trusting man instead of trusting what the Lord has to say. And here's the problem. When you trust man, when you trust man for security or or comfort instead of the Lord, it says in verse number 6, he shall be like the heath in the deserts. Now, I had to look this up. I'm not, I wasn't really familiar with that word before. But heath is a reference to land that is infertile. Like it's not good for growing. Okay? You might get some, some uh, scrubs, uh, sh- sorry, some shrubs that grow on that land, but you're not going to be able to like, pl- you know, farm the land. Okay? It's very infertile. You know, the soil's no good. All right? and that's, a, that's, the, that's the heath. And so God is saying, look, you know, if you trust man instead of, the, instead of trusting the Lord, you're going to be infertile. You're not going to be productive. You're going to be good for nothing, is what he's saying, okay? And then verse number 7. So, in comparison to those that trust man, in verse number 7 it says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, 
neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now, brethren, when you read verse number 7 and 8 there in Jeremiah, I'm just wondering, does it remind you of another passage in the Bible? Does anyone have any thoughts on what, what passage that might remind you of? Well, it's very much like Psalm 1. If you can please turn to the first Psalm, please. Psalm 1. It's, it's very similar. A lot of same wordings there, okay? But the, the point was that if we're blessed, you know, the, the blessed man is one who trusts in the Lord. We don't trust in man. And we'll be like this tree planted by waters. We're going to have the nutrients. We're going to have the healthy soil. We're going to have what we need, the nourishment to be a, a firm tree instead of being like this, you know, shrub that's trying to grow, grow in, in a land, a heath, you know, of a land. And so it's so important, brethren, that you learn to trust in the Lord, okay? That's what's going to keep you going. That's what's going to keep you serving the Lord, you know, all the days of your life. Please don't trust your pastor. Don't set me up and say, you know what, I'm going to serve the Lord so long as we have Pastor Kevin here. I know I'm going to serve the Lord. Don't set me up. I'm just a man. I can fail you. I don't want to fail you, but I can fail you. Okay? And maybe I've already failed you sometimes. <laughs> it's possible. Okay? I'm just a man. Okay? Don't build your, your walk with God on men. I don't care how good of a preacher people are, they're still men. They can still make mistakes. Okay? You set your heart on the Lord, I promise you, no matter if I, if I let you down, or if some other pastors let you down, but if you put your trust in the Lord, I promise you, you're going to be like that tree, and you're going to be planted, you're going to be firm, you're going to be strong, and, and it doesn't matter what happens, it doesn't matter what men let you down, you're still going to be strong serving the Lord. Okay? Look at Psalm 1.1. 1, 1. Psalm 1.1. 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, this is where we get the idea here, in verse number three, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay, so we see that's, you know, almost the same. There was reading in uh, Jeremiah. But what we learn in the, in the psalm there, you know how we read in Jeremiah that, you know, some of that trust in the Lord is like a tree planted by the waters? What psalm adds to that is we understand what those waters are. Again, they're in verse number two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, that's your scriptures, that's your Bible, doth he meditate day and night? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So the rivers of water that give us life, that sustain us, that keep us strong, that nourishes us, brethren, it's the law of the Lord. It's the Bible. It's the Scriptures. Okay? Remember that. In order for you to stay strong as a believer, you need to draw from the waters of the Lord. Okay? Draw from those rivers, which is your Bible reading. Okay? You set down your Bible. You, you, if you stop reading your Bible, you're not going to be able to receive the nutrients, the water, the refreshing water that your tree needs. Okay, to stand strong and not to wither in the time of heat. Back to Jeremiah 17, verse number 9. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9. And I've already preached about the heart, so I'm not going to cover this in any depth. But this is a very famous passage. It's one of my favorite passages. Every time someone says, you know, you trust your heart. I love turning to this passage. Okay, verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So, brethren, who tries or who searches the heart and who tries the reins? Who's going to give every man according to his ways? Now, look, for the wicked, God's going to give according to their ways, aren't they? Isn't he? They're ultimately hell, hellfire. Okay, but... For us as believers, if we're walking in the Spirit, we're doing what the Lord wants from us, He's going to try us as well. He's going to see what's in our heart. You know, as long as we're serving the Lord, you know what? He's also going to give according to our ways. One day the Lord's going to come back and reward us for the great works we were able to do for the Lord. Okay? Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you're going to receive the end results of your ways. Okay? Ideally, you want your ways to be the Lord's ways, okay? Be saved and doing what the Lord requires of you. And God promises you great rewards. But I want you to notice that the Bible says, I, the Lord, search the heart. Now, who says these words? 
You know, sometimes people read the Bible, they, they read the Old Testament, and they tend to think about God the Father. And look, of course, God the Father is the one true God. Absolutely, okay? And uh, sometimes people don't realize, that, or they, they think that, you know, Jesus really only comes into the picture in the New Testament. Well, can you please turn to Revelation chapter 2, please? Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 23. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 23. And as you guys know, the book of Revelations, we're written to seven churches. I won't give you the full context here, but I just want you to notice the word in here, in Revelation 2.23. Jesus Christ says, I will kill her children with death. Speaking about false prophets, and uh, I won't get into that right now. It says this, and then it says, And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So who searches the reins and the hearts? Jesus Christ says, I am he that searches the reins and the hearts. You know, that, that's what he says, right? And I will give unto you according to your works. So in Jeremiah, when we read there, I, the Lord, search the heart, try the reins, and give every man according to his ways. Who's saying those words? Jesus Christ. Okay, these are the words of Jesus. And people are like, oh, you know, I love Jesus. I love the God of the New Testament. You know, Jesus was, was mild. You know, he, he was humble. He was loving. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. That is Jesus. <laughs> that is Jesus, the one that, you know, will cast sinners and, and the lost, those that reject him, into hellfire. It is fire coming from the presence of the Lamb. It's coming from Jesus Christ. So look, Jeremiah knows Jesus Christ. It's Jesus that's given him this word to preach. Okay, so never think that Jesus was not in the Old Testament. Okay? He just reveals himself more so. He explains the Trinity to us. He explains the nature of God to us in the New Testament. So we go back to the Old Testament and we say, man, look, Jesus is all over the place. Okay? The Bible is a Christ-centric book. Okay? Christ first, because you need to go through Christ to get to the Father. Okay? Now, chapter 11, please. Jeremiah 17, verse 11. As the partridge sitteth on eggs, and hatcheth them not... So he that getteth riches. Now, I don't, I don't know about the partridge bird. I, I assume, by, based on this, that they're a type of bird that, that lays its eggs but doesn't sit there to hatch it. Maybe the, maybe the babies hatch by themselves. I'm not sure. Maybe someone that knows better, you can tell me this. Okay? But the point is, you know, this partridge, this, this bird has done all the, all the work to bring forth these eggs, but then it misses out on the birdlings being hatched. Right? It kind of reminds me when that one time that I took my wife I can't remember which baby it was. We took her, took her to Liverpool Hospital to give birth. And, uh, you know, I, I, I parked in emergency and I saw you could only park there like for five minutes. So I said, don't worry, honey. You know, here's a wheelchair. Well, I don't know, someone brought out a wheelchair. I'm going to quickly go park the car. I don't think I was gone more than five minutes. I came back and the baby was already born. <laughs> the baby was born in the emergency, right? So, man, all that work. And it's like, I can't, oh, baby's already gone. Baby's here, right? You kind of missed out on that experience, right? So that's kind of what it's saying. And it says, so he that getteth riches, and not by right. So, so the people in the land, they're getting riches. They're wealthy. They, they've, they've got stuff. Not by the right ways. It says, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and his end shall be a fool. Okay, so what God is saying, part of this judgment is they're not going to be able to enjoy what they've produced. You know, all this labor, trying to be rich, having all the possessions, you know, being prosperous on the land. God is saying, you know what, when my judgment comes, you're not even going to be able to enjoy it. You put all this effort in, and it's going to be gone. Okay? Verse number 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. So I believe Jeremiah here is just thinking back to the good old days, right? When, when Judah was a place, was a godly place, and... You know, God's presence was there. It was this place of sanctuary. Verse number 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Now, I just want to, let's, let's break that down as we read it there. So Jeremiah is saying, he's speaking to the Lord, right? O, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee, so all that forsake God shall be ashamed. And then he says, and they that depart from me, who's me? Jeremiah. Okay. So, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. And so what Jeremiah is saying is this, you know, 
they, the people of the land, they, they have uh, forsaken God, okay? But then Jeremiah also reflects and says, well, they've also departed from me. Because well, who's Jeremiah? Jeremiah is God's man. That's the man that God is using to preach his judgment, to preach his word. And so by, by leaving Jeremiah, by people just listening to Jeremiah, pff, who's this Jeremiah? Who cares? By, by, by acting in that way, they've also rejected the Lord through that process. Okay? And let this be a reminder to you when you go soul winning, okay? and someone you know, maybe mocks you, someone you know, has a go at you, laughs at you, right? ridicules you at the door. Listen, yes, you know, they've left you as it were, but the one they're really rejecting is the Lord God. Okay? Just remember that. Okay? Don't get offended. Don't get flustered. Oh, I can't believe. Listen, they're rejecting God. They're rejecting God, okay? They don't want to listen to you because they don't want to listen to what God has to say. And so what this tells me, brethren, it's so important that we get, you know, behind good men of God, good preachers, good pastors that are preaching God's word, okay? And look, as I told you, I'm a man. I'm going to fail you. I promise you I'm going to fail you. I, I, listen, when I fail you, I want you to remember, oh, Pastor Kevin told me I'm going to fail. He's going to fail me. Okay, just, just remember that, okay? But as long as I'm preaching God's word, Okay, as long as I'm preaching God's word without compromise, you know, every chapter, every verse, right, preaching the truth of God's word, listen, don't leave. Okay, if you like this church, if you like the preaching of the Bible, don't leave this church. Okay, and say, well, you know what, Pastor Kevin preached on hell today. I just don't like hearing that. I'm getting sick of Jeremiah. It's such a negative book. I can't, uh, you know what, I want to come and I want to be happy and rejoice. I want to hear good news all, you know. And I'm, I'm getting sick of this kind of preaching. You leave. Listen. Yeah, okay, you've left me, but really, you're rejecting the Lord. You're, you're walking away from what God wants you to hear and wants you to learn. So listen, you know, look, if one day you leave this church, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not holding anyone hostage. You know, I've had people say to me, you know what, I'm thinking of leaving the church. And I'm, I'm just, I just encourage them. I say, look, if you want to leave, it's your, it's your business. You know, I hope you find another good church, you know, another preacher that's going to preach God's word. You know, you have my blessing. Don't be a stranger. We can still be friends. All right? We can still get along. All right? But where you want to go is at least, when, you know, especially if you're moving to another place, just find another good church. Find a preacher of God's word. All right? You say, well, there is no other good preachers and there's no other good church. Well, then stay here. Stay here then, right? I don't care how big or how small we are. As long as God's word is being preached, listen, as long as the preacher is doing what is right, they're bringing you close to the Lord. They're bringing you to understand and, and learn the words of God. Can you please turn to John chapter 7? Keep your finger there. Turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 37. John chapter 7, verse 37. In Jeremiah, it said, Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. And again, this proves to us that many of the people on the land at this point in time were not saved. I would say the vast majority were not saved. You know, I, I kind of think of Judah here like Australia. You know, it, it's, it's a country. It's got a bit of a Christian heritage to some extent. But really, the majority of Australians, would you agree, are not saved? Just a small portion. Well, the reason that I'm saying that they're not saved is because, they, again, it said they've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Now, when you read John chapter 7, verse 37, it says here, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So he's offering what? The living waters. Verse number 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Look at verse number 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay. So what we understand in the New Testament, that they're, they're, you know, one of the differences with the Old Testament and the, New, and the Old, sorry, New Testament and the Old Testament is that as a believer in the New Testament, you receive the Holy Ghost. You have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And this has been referenced to the living waters. Okay? Out of our belly shall flow uh, rivers of living water. This is, this is the work of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Okay? As long as we're, we're allowing God to change us and to work in us, it's the Holy Ghost that's going to be working in our lives to reflect Christ. Okay? But at what point do we receive this? At salvation. At salvation. Okay? And even though this was not yet given in the Old Testament days, the principle is true. The fact that they are forsaking God, the one who offers the living waters, okay? therefore what are they rejecting? They're rejecting salvation. 
Because it's, it's salvation that gives us those living waters. It's salvation that gives us everlasting waters. Okay? And so these people of the land, they're not just rejecting the judgment, the preaching of, of, of Jeremiah, but they're rejecting salvation. Okay? And I think sometimes we, we, we forget this as we read through the Bible. Okay? Many of these people were just not saved. Okay? I, I look at Judah, no, not that much different to Australia or any other you know, nation on this earth today where the majority are not saved. Back to Jeremiah 17, verse 14. Jeremiah 17, 14. And again, I like Jeremiah because he always reflects back to himself. You know, I always say this when I preach. I don't want you to think, ah, oh, Pastor Kevin's preaching about brother. Brother Matthew today, I knew it. Brother Matt, I hope he's listening. You know, <laughs> don't, don't be that way, okay? Whenever there's preaching, how does this change me? What do I need to do? Who cares about everybody else, right? You listen, you pay attention. You see how God wants to change you. Because Jeremiah's preaching against the, this lost nation, right? Preaching against this, this reprobate nation. But then he says in verse number 14, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For thou art my praise. I like Jeremiah. He does this a lot. He reflects back to himself. He's, he's done preaching. He's done preaching damnation and judgment. And then he stops and goes, man, I'm a sinner too. You know, I need to be healed too. Lord, can you please forgive me? Can you please heal me? You know? And when he says here, save me, he's not talking about salvation of the soul because he's already a saved man, right? Well, what he's referring to, again, he's, he's, been, he's under, trying to understand the judgment of God and he doesn't want to face that. Lord, help save me from your judgment. You know, I don't want to feel the brunt of this judgment to come. You know, save me from this. So you can see Jeremiah, he, he's, he reflects upon himself, right? Verse number 15. Behold, they say unto me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. So they say to Jeremiah, where is the word of the Lord? Come, you know, let it come now. So they, they're mocking Jeremiah. They're being sarcastic. Like, oh, Jeremiah, what do you have to say now? What is God telling you now, Jeremiah? Again, remember, Jeremiah's preaching for years and years and years. Nothing's happening yet. Okay? And brethren, you know what? We just keep preaching. We keep, one day, judgment's going to fall. One day, God's wrath's going to fall in this world. One day, those same people that we preached the gospel to, and they mocked us, they're going to die and they're going to go to hell. Okay? There's not, who cares if they mock, right? People, are, people mock Jeremiah, people mock Jesus, they're going to mock you. Okay? We're just going to learn how to get over it, have thick skin, and, and just get on with the job that Christ has left us to do. Verse number 16. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day thou knowest, that which came out of my lips was right before thee. So what we learn there is that Jeremiah, even though he's preaching the judgment of God, he says, look, in verse 16, neither have I desired the woeful day. He says, God, you know what? I'm preaching this, but I really don't want to see it, Lord. I don't want to experience it, right? He's not like, God, just destroy this nation. Yeah, let it all burn, Lord. Yeah. And he's like, man, Lord, I don't, you know, I'll preach what you want me to preach, Lord. You know, but I just, I don't, you know, he's, he's a man, he's normal, right? He's a normal guy. Okay, he's not this bloodthirsty prophet. He goes, I just don't want to experience it, you know? Neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest. He goes, God, you know, I, I don't want to see this. But look, even if he doesn't want to see it, even if he doesn't want to experience it, right? He says, that which came out of my lips was right before thee. You know, preaching God's word, you're not always going to like it. I don't like preaching against the homos. I don't even like bringing them up. I don't even like preaching about hell. It saddens me a little bit. You know, it's, it's heavy. There are things in the Bible, brethren, that we, I promise you, you know, even now you're thinking, man, I'm going to preach no matter what. You know, something, listen, when you start preaching it, you're going to be like, oh man, I really don't want to preach this again. I'm, you know, but hey, what are we commanded to do? We're commanded that to make sure that our lips are right before God. We preach it no matter what. Okay, that's the kind of person Jeremiah was. He didn't want to see, he wasn't bloodthirsty. He wasn't just trying to want everyone to be destroyed and Jerusalem to be on fire and for people to cast into hell. And he's like, oh, that's wonderful. No, that's not Jeremiah. He goes, I don't want to see it, Lord, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach it anyway because it's what you've given me to do. I'm going to preach your word no matter what. Verse number 17. Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Upon, bring upon them the day of evil, look at this, and destroy them with double destruction. 
Jeremiah just finished saying, I don't want to see this day. Okay? But he knows that God is right. He goes, Lord, destroy them, right? Bring about, bring out, destroy them with double destruction. And of course, this harkens back to Jeremiah 16, if you want to turn there, verse number 18, which said, uh, And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. Okay? So God is telling Jeremiah, you know what? I'm going to recompense their sin double. Next chapter, Jeremiah is like, yeah, bring on the double destruction. <laughs> He's on God's page. He's on God's page, okay? He's preaching God's word. Now, uh, yeah, sorry, verse number 19. Now we get, up, we get onto the topic uh, primarily here of the Sabbath. I don't know if you, as, as the chapter has been read, I don't know if you noticed, but the last few verses is all about the Sabbath day. So God brings up another problem that they're having, another issue that they're facing. It wasn't just the worship of the false gods, okay, and all the other wicked things they were doing, but they had forgotten to observe the Sabbath. Verse 19, Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Jeremiah is saying, look, stop working on the Sabbath. That's what he's preaching, right? Nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. He says, look, if you're bringing stuff, you know, to sell into Jerusalem, but it's a Sabbath, well, stop. Don't bring it anymore into Jerusalem. Stop on the Sabbath. It's a time of rest. Stop laboring. Stop working. Verse number, what about to brother? 20? Oh yeah, 22. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work. Now that's really important, right? Jeremiah is referring to all this burden that they're doing, all this carrying. He says, this is work. Neither do ye any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. All right, so when did God command the fathers? Of course, you know, the, keeping the Sabbath day was one of the Ten Commandments, was it not? Okay, I'll quickly read it to you in Exodus 20, verse 8. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's one of the Ten Commandments, okay? And these descendants of those fathers, those forefathers, they're neglecting the Sabbath, right? They're, so it's not, they're, they're, look, they're, they're, they're no longer a Christian nation. There's nothing about this nation that, that yells out, Man, this is a Christian nation. This is a nation that loves the Lord. Right? They're, they're not obeying even this, this commandment to not obey the Sabbath. You might say, well, you know, should we keep the Sabbath then, Pastor Kevin? Should we not be laboring on a, on a Saturday? And should we be keeping this one day where we have no, no work? You know, is that what we're required to do? Because Jeremiah, God seems very angry at these people for not doing it. Well, let's keep going. Verse number 23. But they, ob they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of the city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein, then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. God's given them another chance. He says, look, just keep the Sabbath. If you keep the Sabbath, God's promising, look, this city is going to remain forever. This city is not going to be burnt down. You keep the Sabbath. You just do this part for me. I'm going to make sure the Babylonians don't come and destroy you. Okay. Now, you know, are we required to not work on the Sabbath? Well, yes and no. <laughs> it's both yes and no. Okay. So let's have a look at this. Can you please turn to Colossians chapter 2? Colossians chapter 2, verse number 16. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 16. Is the Sabbath day important? Of course it is. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's, it's really important. Okay. And look, sometimes when I go door to door soul winning, I encounter a Seventh day Adventist. The Seventh day Adventists believe they're keeping the Sabbath, but they're not keeping it, but they believe they are. Okay? And they're telling, they'll say to me, Do you keep the Sabbath? I've learned how to respond to them. I'll just say, Yes, I do keep the Sabbath. Okay? And they're like, Oh, wow, amazing. You know? 
But that's not the Sabbath that I'm keeping, that they think about, right? That's not the Sabbath. Because look, in Colossians 2.16, Colossians 2.16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. So let no one judge you about the Sabbath days. Well, isn't Jeremiah judging this nation about the Sabbath days? Of course he is, right? Say, so what's the significance of all these things, including the Sabbath? Verse number 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Listen, the Sabbath day was a shadow of Christ. Okay, I've used this example before. You know, before a baby is born, mothers generally have photographs of the ultrasound. Okay? Now that ultrasound is not really the baby. Okay? It, it's, I don't know how it works. It's, it's, the, it's, the, the, it's, it's image created by sound. Right? It's an really, it, it's a, it's a image of the baby. It's not the baby. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a shadow of the baby. Right? Like if, if, I'm, if I'm... Do I have a shadow here when I walk? I don't know. If, if you guys... You know, maybe I'm, I'm out of the picture. Maybe I'm in another room. But you start to see my shadow. You know, oh, there's, you know, there's Pastor Kevin. He's coming along. You know? and, and I walk in. Are you going to walk up to my shadow and, hey, shadow, how are you? No, listen, once the, once the body has arrived, the shadow is irrelevant. Once the baby is born, the ultrasound pictures are irrelevant. Right? When you celebrate, you know, a baby's one-year birthday party, all right, and you take out the cake and you invite your family and friends to celebrate and you set up the cake, you don't have in front of the cake all the ultrasound pictures and, and your, you know, your guests come and say, hey, where's the baby? Don't worry about the baby. Ultrasound pictures are here. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. Isn't that wouldn't you say that's stupid? Once the baby is born, okay, the ultrasound pictures are worthless. That's not what's important. Someone comes to see your baby. You don't show them ultrasound pictures. You show them the newborn baby. That's what they want to see. That's what the Sabbath day was. was it are ultrasound pictures important? Are they helpful? Of course they are. But until, when the baby is born, they're worthless. Okay? They were a shadow of things to come. Guess what? The Sabbath day was a shadow of Jesus Christ. You say, in what sense? Because the Sabbath day was a day of rest, of no works. Listen, you've heard more than once behind this pulpit, you know, many preachers saying that one of our key doctrines is rest, no works. You say, what is that? Salvation, the gospel, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is no works. It's rest. We rest on the finished work of Jesus Christ. So what's the Sabbath supposed to represent? The Sabbath was, was meant to represent the gospel. They understood the gospel with these shadows, these pictures that God put in their holy days, in their celebrations, in the feasts, to always point to Christ. That's why we don't do the things that the Old Testament saints do, because now we have Jesus, right? But the body is of Christ. Guess what else, what else is the body of Christ? The New Testament church. Okay, we don't need to celebrate the Passover. We don't need to go and offer sacrifices. We don't need to, uh, you know, go and, and celebrate. Uh, sorry, and rest on, on Saturday. What's the point? Christ has come. He set up His church. We're here to serve Him now. That's what's important. People that go back to the Sabbath day and these things, they're going back to the ultrasound. They're going back to the shadow. You know, it, it's 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 pointless. It means nothing now. Okay, it's vain. And so, listen. The reason God's saying, look, you just fix this up, you're going to last, for, you, the city's going to remain. There's going to be kings, you're going to continue, because this is the most important doctrine, salvation, not of works. Simply believe in, simply rest in on what Christ has done for us. Back to Jeremiah 17, verse 26. Jeremiah 17, verse 26. So, what a, they've corrupted the gospel. Yeah? By, by not observing the Sabbath, they are symbolically corrupt, corrupting the gospel. They're symbolically saying that the gospel is a gospel of works. Why would they want to work on the Sabbath day? Why do you think they would want to work? Money, profit, okay? It's all self. It's all about me, okay? Uh, why stop working today? You know, I can make more profit if I were to sell into Jerusalem, if I could bring my things into the city on the Sabbath day. Hey, I'll do, some, I'll do more work. I can profit more. Yeah, but you've destroyed the gospel. Okay? And the whole nation has become reprobate in the eyes of God. Okay? God has enlarged hell to take these people in. Verse number 26. And they shall come from the cities of Judah, and from the places about Jerusalem, and from the land of Benjamin, and from the plain, and from the mountains, from the south, bring in burnt offerings and sacrifices and meat offerings and incense, and bring in sacrifices of praise 
unto the house of the Lord. That's if they kept the Sabbath. God is promising all these wonderful things. Verse number 27. But if ye will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So God now warns them, if you don't, stop, if you don't, if you don't hallow the Sabbath day, if you don't keep the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the places, the, sorry, the palaces of Jerusalem. Now, before I keep reading, God's speaking, of course, about the judgment of Babylon, and we know they burnt it all by fire, the, the gates, the city, the palaces, all the buildings, okay? But then he says, and it shall not be quenched. So not just what's happening with Babylon, but the fires will continue to burn. They will not be quenched. Okay, what's that about? Again, hell. Okay, hellfire that will not be quenched. And so by corrupting the gospel, by believing or, or making it seem like, you know, that uh, uh, you know, salvation is by works, you know, those people that believe salvation is by works, what's going to happen? What's their end? Hellfire, right? They're going to be in a fire that cannot be quenched. You know, a judgment that's even more severe than the Babylonians coming and slaughtering people, burning down, destroying families, taking everything. There's a greater judgment to come and it's in hellfire. And it's for those that believe in works. Listen, only biblical Christianity, it's the only religion that I know of that teaches that salvation is by resting. It's by faith alone. Just trust what Christ has done for us. Every other religion, you know, Islam, you know, Roman Catholicism, I mean, all the false gospels, right? Every, every, every false way to heaven, brethren, guess what they're teaching? They're teaching works. They're teaching works. Once again, people are going to hell in the millions. And so, brethren, we need to be like Jeremiah, you know? God wants to use us, as I taught this morning, to be the preachers, to bring peace between man and God. We have this ministry of reconciliation. And look, if, if, if nothing drives you to get out there and knock doors, consider hell for a moment. Read Bible passages about hell. Is that really where you want your fellow Australian to go? You know? Listen, we can't save the whole nation, but we can save people one at a time. You know, one at a time. You know, every week, a few people at a time. There's going to be great rejoicing in heaven because we've been able to pull them out of the fire. Okay, let's pray.